Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church. So glad that you're with us this morning. Uh, I am not Des Wadsworth, our lead pastor. If you uh, are going, ah, oh, dang it. You get me. Sorry. No, excited to be here this morning. Excited to uh, be able to go into this series that we've been in called Hidden Thread. And in the Hidden Thread, we're talking about Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. Jesus being present in the Old Testament. And over the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at Abraham and Isaac and how Abraham was shown the fact that Jesus would be the ultimate sacrifice, that there would be provided someone else to be the sacrifice. And this week we're going to go a little different in the story because we're going to go into to something else and and if you look at theological terms, this is called a Christophany. This is where Jesus actually shows up in the Old Testament. Okay? And so we're going to look at this story that, that I think is amazing, that proves that Jesus was present in the beginning, Jesus is present now, and Jesus is present in the future. Jesus will be with you in your best of times and in your toughest times. Now, I know that not all of us grew up in church. Many in this room have probably come to faith, come to know Jesus at a later time in life. But I grew up in church. And I remember this story specifically being taught, and I thought about getting this on Etsy or whatever, a flannel graph, all right? A flannel graph, which is this horrible um, predating video, uh, like black and white TVs were still the thing, so instead they use color flannel felt to tell these stories. And this is the story of three guys that were thrown into a fiery furnace. You will know them as Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Aha, uh -huh, you don't. So, because they were given new names, and so uh, we're going to go into this a little bit. In Daniel chapter 1, verses 3, we read this story, and we read the story about King Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon is hungry for power. He is hungry to conquer other nations. He is hungry for, give me everything I want. And so King Nebuchadnezzar goes and conquers this area called Judah. All right? And as he goes, and once they have conquered this area, he says, bring back some of the finest young men to serve in my court. All right? Now, when I was growing up, finest young men meant they were in their 20s, 30s, right? Young men. Uh, in looking at the story more, these are 12, 13, 14-year-old boys that were brought back to serve King Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm going to pick up the story right here in Daniel chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, where he says, Bring back young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Okay, so these young boys were brought back to Babylon. They were then going to be instructed, they were going to be mentored for the next three years, everything about Babylon. They were going to, all of a sudden, take in everything that they hadn't heard before, 
and replace what they knew before with new information. The problem is with Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah that they had been taught all this stuff growing up as a kid about God. You see, in Deuteronomy, it tells parents, talk about this as you're going along the road. Talk about this as they lie down to sleep, as you sit at the table. They were instructed in ways of God all through their lives. As a matter of fact, Daniel, the name Daniel in Hebrew means Yahweh is my judge. Hananiah means Yahweh is has been gracious. Mishael, who is as Yahweh is. And then Azariah, Yahweh has helped. Not only were they taught about God, they were named names that meant something about God. This has been ingrained in them over and over and over. As soon as they get to Babylon, and this is where all of a sudden you're going to go, oh, I know this story. Daniel is given the name Belteshazzar. Hananiah is given the name Shadrach. Mishael is Meshach. And Azariah is Abednego. How many have heard Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Okay, a few more. So these four guys have been ripped out of Judah, placed in the king's court, and they are being instructed. And it says there in verses 4 and 5, it talks about give them food from the king's table and wine from the king's table as well. You see, this is a problem for these young men. All of a sudden, they're being asked to do something and to be given something that they have been told no all their lives. And so Daniel speaks up for them, and Daniel says, don't give us the choice food from the king's table. Don't give us the wine from the king's table. Instead, give us vegetables to eat. Because he knew that there was food that would be given to them that they were not allowed to eat as Hebrew boys. And so the servant that is in charge of their tutoring, their mentoring, says, whoa, 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 I can't do that. I can't give you something else because if you show up, in the next two weeks and you look different than the rest of the young boys that are a part of this, I'll be in trouble and my head will be taken off. And so Daniel says to him, just give us 10 days. Just try this for 10 days. And if we are not as healthy and as fit as them, then we can talk. Well, sure enough, 10 days go by And they are more healthy. They stand out above the rest. And it it says in verses 17 through 20, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king, after the three years to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. There is so much in that. You see, they were pressured to do what the king wanted them to do. Eat this meal. Eat this choice food. But they knew that if they did that, that was a compromise from what they had been instructed their whole lives. They knew that that was not what God wanted from them. 
And so instead they said, test us. Give us this, test us. And at the end of the time, they were more knowledgeable, 10 times more knowledgeable than the rest of those that had been in the same program. So then we're going to jump ahead a little bit to chapter 2 in this. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has a dream. And he is so full of himself that he says, bring all the wise men, bring all the prefects, the satraps, bring all the astrologers to me, and I want them to interpret my dream. I want them to tell me what my dream meant. But he goes, this is, this is where he's just so full of himself. I'm not going to tell them what the dream is. They have to tell me what the dream is and then tell me what it means. Impossible. How, how in the world is that going to happen? So he brings all the wise men over to him. They sit there and they go, King, we don't know what that. We, we don't know. Can you just tell us the dream? Just give us a little clue here. He says, no. So they go away. They come back a little bit later. King, we, we don't know. Can you just, just a little hint. Just whisper it in my ear. Nebuchadnezzar gets so upset, he says, I'm going to kill all of you. This is how bloodthirsty he is. I'm going to kill all of the wise men in the country, all the prefects, the satraps, the wise men, the astrologers, every single one of them, because they can't tell me my dream. And so this is where Daniel comes back on the scene. Because Daniel hears, we're going to be killed because none of the wise men can tell the king his dream. And so the first small group happens. Because Daniel, in verse 17 and 18, Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven, considering this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Daniel goes, guys, we, we got we to consult with God on this. And so they get together and they spend time praying, asking God for wisdom and favor. Daniel then goes to the king and he not only tells the king the dream and what it means, he tells him exactly what he had dreamt. And King Nebuchadnezzar is amazed at this and so in verses 48-49, the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. The king made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administer, administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. It wasn't just I told the king his dream. It was, I told him everything about the dream and gave him the interpretation. And now Daniel is elevated to a higher status. And it wasn't enough for him to go, I've been promoted. Wait, wait, wait. Bring my three friends along with me. Promote them as well. Looking out for those around him. All of this happens, and really this is, that is just cursory. Uh, it has nothing to do with the rest of what I want to talk about today, except that it gives a basis, a foundation for where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and, Abed, and Abednego have been. It gives an understanding of all that they have gone through. They were taken out of Judah, brought into captivity, studied for three years. At the end of the three years, they were promoted because they were ten times wiser than anybody around them. And then, after the dream has been interpreted, they're promoted again 
because King Nebuchadnezzar finds favor in them. And that's where we pick up in chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar gets this big head. He already had it. He gets a bigger head after this dream is interpreted to him. You see, in the dream, he is told that he is supreme over everything else. So he builds a statue, and he doesn't build just a little tiny statue. King Nebuchadnezzar builds a statue that is 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. He makes sure that everyone can see this statue. And then he commands everyone to worship, to bow down to this statue anytime that they hear, and we'll go through the list in a moment, but anytime they hear this music, you are to bow down and worship this statue. So then in Daniel chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, we read this. The herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you're commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Okay. Pretty easy, right? As soon as you hear all this music, you are to bow down and worship the statue. If you don't, you will be thrown into a blazing furnace, which my little mind looking at the flannel graph had no concept of. No idea what that really looked like. And so this starts to happen. The music starts to play. Everybody would turn. They would bow to the idol, bow to the statue. They would go about their day. The music would play. They would bow to the statue. They would go about their day. The music would play. They would bow to the statue. Some astrologers, though, they're watching. They want to see, is everybody following this? Is everybody doing what they're told? And so I like to call these guys the tattletales because they go to King Nebuchadnezzar and they go, hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're not doing that. They're not bowing down to this statue, king. And you know what you said about them. Remember, there's a little bit of jealousy here, I'm sure, because they have been promoted time and time again over the astrologers, the prefects, the satraps, the wise people. So King Nebuchadnezzar calls Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to him, and he says to them, you must bow down when the music plays. Whenever you hear the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the whatever, you must bow down and worship. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a choice to make. They had a choice to make. And that leads to the first point here. We will always have pressure to compromise. No matter where you're at in life, you will always have pressure to compromise. I don't care if you're little. I don't care if you're in high school, college. Maybe it's you're in your 20s, 30s. Maybe you're in retirement. You will always feel a pressure to compromise. Because it's easier to do it that way. It, it's more comfortable to do it that way. Here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had proven themselves 
over and over and over again. Yet the king says to them, if you do not bow to me, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. We all have a pressure to compromise. Sometimes that's in our relationships. Oh, I can hang out with them this once. Yeah, I know they're going to do that, but, you know, it's all right. I'll, I'll kind of stay over here. We feel the pressure to compromise at work. Ah, they're not working so hard, so why am I working so hard? They're not putting in a full eight hours, so why am I putting in a full eight hours? They're not, so why? And we feel this pressure to compromise. There's a pressure to compromise. Maybe it's in our finances. Oh, I can, I can get a little bit ahead here if I, if I don't do that. There's a pressure to compromise in how we earn money and how we then spend it. So then we go on to verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. King, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, still respectful, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. That takes some guts. They are standing face to face with the king. And they say to him, we do not need to defend ourselves. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, God will deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from you. But even if he doesn't, whoa. Wait a second, are you saying that there's a possibility it won't go our way? Even if he doesn't, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Trusting God should always come over our comfort. It is much easier for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to go, you know what? I bet it's pretty hot in there. We'll do this this once. Maybe, they'll, maybe they won't keep watching us then. Instead, they say, God will deliver us from this. And even if he doesn't, we still will not bow to your idol. Even if he doesn't. Even if he doesn't. It's easy for us to have faith when everything is going our way. <laughs> it's easy for us to have faith when we get the job that we want. It's easy for us to have faith when, when we have the health that we want. It's easy for us to have faith when we get the relationship that we want. It's easy for us to have faith when we have all the money in the bank that we want. But what happens when we don't? What happens when God doesn't give us what we want? What happens when things don't go the way we thought they would? I've shared uh, different times when, when I get to speak things about my family, things about uh, my mom especially, all right? And growing up, we didn't have everything that everybody else had. We grew up fairly poor. 
And it was okay. We had everything that we needed. We didn't grow up with everything that we wanted, but I had a mom that loved Jesus above everything else. I watched her and her faith. Church was never an option for us. I've got plenty of stories of how church was never an option for us. And she would load multiple kids, grandkids in the car and we would go to church on Sundays and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. And all the time we were at church. Giving was never an option for us. Right after I got the, the you know, fix your hair thing or there's something on your face, lick, I'd always get, you know, the two quarters or the dollar to put in the offering plate because it was important to model that to my mom. She wanted to make sure we knew that we give first back to God, no matter how big or little it was. And trust me, 25 cents, 50 cents back in the day was huge. But we'd put it in the offering plate every time. The same has been true for my family. We've been in ministry for 20 plus years. We have never, we have never not had what we needed. Not always what we want, but God always provided our needs. We've had to trust God above our own comfort at times. Going to church, being in community has never been optional for me as a kid, for my kids, for my family. It's important to us. Being here is important to us. Being in community with others that have the same belief system, the same trust and faith is important to us. Giving first back to God has never been optional to us. This is something that was ingrained in me over the years, and, and this is the simplest way that I know to say it. We give first because it honors God. It shows trust in Him. We save second because it builds wealth. Yes, we do believe that it is important to have your own personal wealth. And then we live on the rest because it teaches contentment. Give first to honor God. Save second to build wealth. Live on the rest. Teaches contentment. Teaches us to be happy with what we have. Sometimes that's not comfortable. Sometimes it's hard. But it's been something that is important to us to the point where it is an automatic thing for us because we want to give back to God who first gave to us. God gave his son first, so we give to him first. Giving is not about what God wants from you. He doesn't need your money. God doesn't need you to give to him. It's what he wants for you. He wants to show and impress upon you that giving first honors him. He wants you to live on the rest. After you save, he wants you to live on the rest because it teaches, teaches us to be content. Teaches us to be happy with what we have. It's a little side note but I think it's important. If you, I'm gonna keep going on the side note. If you can't give back to God what he has given to you, that compromise starts really young. 
And if you can't give him what he has given you, where's your faith? Trusting God should always come above our comfort. Okay, so let's talk about this fire a little bit. Let's talk about this fire a little bit. It's not the fiery furnace that we find in Home Alone, all right? Uh, All of you that remember when uh, Macaulay Culkin goes down into the basement and the fire starts talking to him, it's not that fire. It's much bigger than that. People can be thrown into this furnace, all right? And so this is where things take a turn. And King Nebuchadnezzar, who has just promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego multiple times, says this, Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered this furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, their trousers, their turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent, the furnace was so hot, that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. All right. Now we got some action. So this fire is big enough to hold not just one person, hold multiple people, right? They stoked it so hot, they put in so much wood that it got seven times hotter than normal. How many of you have ever been at a bonfire? Okay, how many of you have ever been at a bonfire where somebody goes, hey, I'm going to throw a little extra wood on it, and it gets so hot that you have to back away? right? It gets so hot that there's absolutely no way you can sit close to it. You can't roast any marshmallows anymore because unless you have a stick that's 10 feet long, it's way too hot. This is seven times hotter than usual. It was so hot that it killed the men that threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into it. All I see is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Their faces are melting away, and they are dead, on the spot, done. In my head, these men are thrown in, these others are killed, and King Nebuchadnezzar walks away, sits down, and goes, "Ah, yep, that's what I did. But then it says he leaps to amazement and asks his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar has no idea, no reference to who God is. All he knows is that fourth image in the fire looks like a son of the gods. I don't know what's going through his mind at that point, but first of all, he's got dead guys on the outside of the fire, and he's got four guys, though he only threw three guys into the fire. I'm sure he's shaking just a little bit. And this is where it shows us that God will never leave us on our own. God will never leave us on our own. Jesus was in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Jesus was standing there walking around in the fire probably going like this just a little bit. Maybe, you know, Jesus is walking around in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
I want to look at the importance of fire. Fire is vital in our lives. Fire provides light. Fire provides heat. If you watch the TV show Survivor, fire represents life. Fire is important. And I think that God uses this fire to show us something. You see, in our life, fire is used to refine us. In our faith, fire is used to refine us. It burns away what isn't healthy. It burns away the unnecessary. And it leaves just a pure pure substance. If it's a refining gold, it just leaves pure gold. If it's refining silver, it's just pure silver. Everything else is burned away. God used this fire to purify and to show how pure he is. Jesus was in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he's in the fire with us now. God will never leave us on our own. We all go through trials. We're all tempted to compromise. It never ends. Students, you can ask any of our older generation, is the pressure to compromise ever end? They will all say no. There is always a pressure to compromise. We get uncomfortable when we're in the fire. We get uncomfortable when God is allowing something to refine us, to purify us. We get antsy. How can we fix this? How can we make this end on our own? We try to solve the problem. And I'm just going to say this. What if God is asking you not to get through it, but to trust him more? What if God is actually saying, trust me more in this? Put your faith in me more in this work situation. Put your faith in me more in this relationship. Trust me with your finances. Jesus is in the fire with you. I want to ask, what is the fire? What are the fires that are in your life right now? And we've all got them. We all have something that we wish could go away. But the bigger question is, do you recognize that Jesus is walking there with you? Jesus is right beside you through the fire. God will never leave us on our own. I talked about my mom earlier and the faith that she had. And my mom passed away a couple of years ago and uh, I did something to remember her. And so I got this tattoo, all right? It's a flower from her house. Uh, It is the outline of, of this flower from her house. And then it says, he walks with me. And that phrase, he walks with me, was from her favorite uh, hymn that we were actually singing when she passed. And that hymn is called In the Garden. And it says, he walks with me, he talks with me, he tells me that I am his own. And it is not just a memory, a thing to remind me of my mom. It's a reminder for me. He walks with me. He is always with me. God never leaves me because he walks with me. So then uh, I'm going to go back to verses 26 and 27. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. 
So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. I can just see it. They are so close. They just want to touch and find out what in the world just happened here. But it says this, they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. No smell of fire on them. I asked earlier, how many of you have been at a bonfire? How many of you have been at a bonfire? Have you ever walked away from a bonfire and not smelled like the smoke? No. It's impossible. It's impossible to walk away from a bonfire and not smell like smoke. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't just walk away from the bonfire. They walked away from being in the fire and still didn't smell like smoke. I think, I think there's something in that. I think there's something in the idea of they didn't smell the smoke. Because, you see, I think a lot of us go through these fires and the only thing we can think of afterwards is, I smell like smoke. I smell like what I've gone through. I'm reminded every day of the fact that I have gone through this. And maybe it's guilt. Maybe it's just the memories of the fire. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came through the fire and they didn't smell like smoke. I think we need to move through our lives a little bit like that. God takes us through fire. God takes us through these trials and it's okay to remember, but it's not okay to come back to it all the time. I still smell the smoke. I still smell the smoke. Get a little bit further away. Man, I can still smell the smoke. God is saying, Trust me, I am right here with you all the time. You don't have to go back to the smoke. You don't have to go back into that fire. There may be other fires, but you don't have to go back to that one. Don't live in the smoke. Live knowing that Jesus is walking with you. In Isaiah chapter 43, we read this. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Guys, God's plan for your life is greater than you know. God has a plan for your life that has not been fully given to you yet. It's greater than you know. And God's presence is beyond our imagination. God will amaze you how he's going to show up and the way he's going to provide in the future. In your discomfort, he will provide. God is calling you to something greater. And when we have the courage to do the unthinkable, God will do the supernatural. When we have the courage to do the unthinkable, God will do the supernatural. As you finish out that story about King Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you hear the king say, elevate them again, and whoever says anything against their God, kill them. 
Some guys never learn, right? But Nebuchadnezzar realized that they serve the most high God. I'm going to ask our prayer partners and our elders to to come up front so that they can pray for you and with you. This is an opportunity for us to to bring things to God that he knows, but maybe we need to give over to him to get rid of the smoke. Have you been compromising? Have you been following a path that maybe God isn't asking you to do? You've been compromising in your faith, compromising at work, compromising it in relationships, compromising with your finances. Do you need to trust God over your own comfort? Do you need to go, God, allow me to be uncomfortable so that I can trust you more? And is there a smell of fire that you just want to stop checking on? Is there a smell of fire that you just want to say, it's behind me, I'm moving forward? At the end of the service, please come, pray with our elders, pray with our prayer partners. They want to pray for you. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we... Thank you for the fact that you will never leave us on our own. God, the fact that you love us so much that you are in the fire with us. Not saying trust me from a distance, but trust me, hold my hand. God, I pray that we can all give our lives over to you to live in discomfort so that we can trust you more. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.